college football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. All right, welcome to it. Winning Cures Everything. I'm your host, Gary Seegers. That's right. And uh, it's been a little bit since we knocked one of these out. So uh, I am on a road trip right now. And I'm actually going to try and knock out two of these just in case. Right? One can be kind of evergreen or whatever. Uh, but the this one I'm going to put out on Monday, April 1st which is April Fool's Day, but uh, I'm not going to be doing any April Fool's for this one. Uh, again, I'm your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on all the socials at GaryWCE. I would certainly appreciate that. If you've not already subscribed to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube page, all that fun stuff. And uh, make sure that you are subscribed to the Bet US College Football Show. That would certainly be appreciated as well. Uh, hopefully everybody is having a good Monday thus far. Hopefully everybody is having uh, or has had a good Easter weekend. That's right, Easter. Lots going on. And so that is the exact reason why I was headed out of town. So, all right. Let's go on and jump in. Topic number one for today. The NFL kickoff change. It's been a lot of talk about whether or not college football is going to adopt this. Now, the change that is being implemented in the NFL is the old XFL kickoff, right? Uh, You've got the kicker that is standing, I think it's 15 yards behind uh, where the teams are lined up. And and basically they're going to be five yards apart from each other. But you're going to have the kicking team lined up 15 yards in front of the kicker. And then the other team, the defensive team that's blocking and whatnot, they are... Uh, lined up, I think, five yards in front of them. It might be ten. But then you've got a kick returner or two that are even further back. And nobody can block until the kick returner gets the ball. So it allows for more kickoff returns. And it also cuts down on the number of energies, or in energies, injuries, excuse me. You can tell it's been a minute, right? So, I do believe that this is going to be something that will be implemented in college football. And the reason that I believe that is, no, not every FBS team has got a kicker that can just boot it into the end zone all the time, right? Not all of them. But the Power 5 programs certainly do. They have got, uh, they've got multiple guys that can boot that thing deep, and you end up with just a bunch of touchbacks. And it's a play that, you know, it almost makes you wonder why you're even running it. Because you can go an entire game, multiple games, without anybody returning a kick. And I don't know who would want that, right? I mean, it's you, you want there to be some kind of action. You want it to be uh, viewable, right? You want people to be, or not viewable, but watchable. You want people to want to watch that play. Like, these things have to be important. Every now and then, you're, I think the, the leading college football returner had, like, just over 500 yards. It was a kid from Kentucky. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, you're going to see this happen because you want more people to return kicks. Kick returning used to be a thing. Now, punt returns, it is what it is on that. But when it comes to kickoff returns, yeah. And, and you want to find a way to cut down on injuries. So if you're only a few yards away from each other, uh, yeah. That, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world to me. So I'm, I'm a fan of this. I do think college football is going to adopt this eventually. They'll, they'll see how it works in the NFL. And then like everything else with the NFL, it'll end up coming back down to college. You know, there's a few discrepancies between uh, the NFL game and the college game. Uh, but now, I mean, they, they just put in a two-minute warning in college football. Which, why? Like, the NFL doesn't even necessarily need the two-minute warning anymore, but it's a part of the strategy, and coaches are moving back and forth between college and NFL, and NFL and college, back and forth, back and forth. The players are going to be going from college to the NFL. So, I guess they just decided, yeah, why not, you know? And so, 
it, it, it was back to a, a bygone day when the NFL, they didn't have clocks in the stadium. So it was like a warning to let everybody know, hey, there's only two minutes left in this game. So, I, again, no reason for the two-minute warnings. But, hey, you know, uh, if you're going to have kickoffs instead of, you know. Oh, the other part of this is if you're going to attempt an onside kick, you have to let people know ahead of time. Uh, so you then you would go back to the normal way of doing a kick return. And so everybody line up. You got your hands team. You know, everybody's ready for uh, a short kick. But it is the way it goes. It is the way it goes. So I, I do think that college will adopt it eventually, maybe as early as the 2025 season, uh, because the 2024 season is when the NFL is going to put that thing in there. Uh, we'll see about the the hip drop tackle. We'll see whether college decides to take it out. Uh, but the NFL PA... You know, they, they said, no, we do not want this out. The Players Association said, we do not want this uh, banned from the game. We, they don't, we don't want this to be a penalty. And the NFL did it anyway. So we'll, we'll see if that ends up making its way down to college football as well. Uh, topic number two, Chris Smelly, the former South Carolina quarterback, uh, he was rescued. He went kayaking in Florida and disappeared, apparently. And he got uh, sent, you know, two miles away from wherever, and he was stuck in the Gulf of Mexico. And they had to send out a rescue unit. And the video of this is freaking awesome. I think he's the coach at, is it Trustville, maybe? I'm trying to remember. But he, you know, they went kayaking, and somehow he found himself somewhere that he was not supposed to be. And, yeah, they found him, which was amazing because... These kind of things typically do not end well, right? I mean, everybody remembers the Ryan Mallett situation uh, where I think it was around Destin, maybe, where, you know, I went out for a swim in the ocean, got caught in a riptide, and couldn't get back out. And so uh, that, that's that's what ended up happening to him. But luckily, Chris Melly was in a uh, kayak and wasn't too far gone, but they, I mean, they found him. It was like... It was like looking at a pinprick uh, from the helicopter. I mean, they were they were just lucky enough to be able to get him. Uh, cheers to that. Cheers to that rescue squad with the Coast Guard. Uh, that was awesome. So I'm glad that, that Chris Smelly is still around doing his thing. Uh, moving on, topic number three. Notre Dame new AD Pete Bivacqua. He was quoted as saying uh, their independent status is now more valuable than ever. There was a big ESPN write-up about this and whatnot, and basically, I'll give you my two cents on it. I think he might be on to something. Because we have no idea what the future of the sport is really going to look like. There's no reason for Notre Dame to run. I, I have been convinced for a long time that Notre Dame was going to go back, or not back, but they were going to go to the Big Ten. And there's just no reason for them to do that. Uh, they are tied in with the ACC. So long as the ACC is still around, then they're okay. They are independent in football, but they get extra money from their Olympic sports and whatnot, basketball and everything else, right? Uh, they get, I believe, $17 million in their ACC contract. Now, there's no sense in them doing anything crazy right now because... We're going to find out in February of 2025 whether or not ESPN is going to pick up their option for the next uh, nine years from 2027 through 2036. But they have to exercise that option in February of 2025. And there's no sense in Notre Dame thinking about anything between now and then. Now, if ESPN does not pick up that option, if Florida State and Clemson find a way to force themselves out of this conference – then the ACC might go bust and Notre Dame might just say, ah, screw it. Or Notre Dame could be the team that hops in there and uh, kind of stabilizes things because right now there's 17 teams. Uh, if you lose Clemson and Florida State, that would be 15 teams. Well, then if Notre Dame decided, eh, if we're going to join a conference, we're going to join these guys, 
well, that would bump them up to 16 teams. And Notre Dame's conference schedule would be easy. Easy, easy. So Notre Dame has plenty of options. They could just stay doing what they do, uh, hanging out, doing the NBC deal. You know, got their scheduling agreement with the, uh, the ACC. That You know they'll always be top of the list for some of these bigger brands to do home and homes. Like So they, they'll be able to do whatever they want to do. Right now they have so much flexibility that there's no reason for them to go and do anything else. So I think that Pete Bavacqua is on to something here. But, again, the landscape is shifting, and it is, I don't think it's anywhere near done. There's no sense in Notre Dame doing anything until we figure out what Florida State and Clemson are going to end up doing. Uh, let me tell you right quick, Ticket Smarter. Oh, yes, TicketSmarter.com. Look, you need to go there, and you need to check out the deals that they've got on concert tickets, on sporting events, on everything else. The Sweet 16 and Elite 8 were this prior weekend, and tickets were crazy. Tickets to the Final Four this coming weekend are going to be nuts. Save some money while you are buying your tickets. And the easy way to do that is go to TicketSmarter.com, and you can use the promo code WCE10 for $10 off an order of $100 or more, or WCE20 for $20 off an order of $300 or more. And you can use that code every single time. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a sign-up bonus. It's not none of that. Anytime you want to buy tickets, you go to TicketSmarter.com, and you enter in those codes. That is the best way to go about it. So, highly, highly recommended. I have used them myself. They are fantastic. They get you the tickets when you need them. Uh, their customer service is awesome. Never had a problem with anybody. Um, I am, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. So, do yourself a favor. Think smarter, ticket smarter. All right, topic number four on this one. Washington State's AD, Pat Chun, went over to Washington to be their new AD, right? Troy Dannon, who was the Washington AD for the past, like, six months or whatever it was, uh, he left to go to Nebraska. So Washington called Washington State's AD, Pat Chun, and said, hey, would you like to come over here and take this job? We'll give you a six-year contract and blah, 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 blah. Washington State, nobody knows exactly what the future is going to hold for them right now. They are part of the Pac-2. Maybe they'll try and rebuild, I guess, uh, redevelop the the Pac-12, or maybe make it a Pac-10, uh, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Maybe they'll do something like that. But nobody knows whether or not that's possible. Uh, the most likely option might be that they join the Mountain West as an actual full member of the conference. Uh, as it sits right now, I think their basketball program is going to be part of the WCC for the next couple of years. Uh, so Gonzaga and St. Mary's, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, nobody knows what's up with Washington State. But Pat Chun left and Jake Dickert was asked about this. And Jake Dickert, when asked about Pat Chun leaving, he said, and I quote, we need people who want to be here. Now, I understand where he's coming from. He's been very passionate about getting his opportunity at Washington State. He's been very passionate about the people in Pullman. Uh, same thing in Corvallis, you know, etc. Right? He's... He did not like this idea of the Pac-12 just disintegrating. And part of that might be the fact that Washington State was going to be left without a home. But I almost wonder if some people can be loyal to a fault, which sounds a little crazy. Jonathan Smith was the head coach at Oregon State. He played quarterback at Oregon State. He went to school there. Like, that was his place. He got his head coaching opportunity in Corvallis. Like, he, he was a beaver. And when all of this stuff went down, he got a call to go to Michigan State, and he took the job. And nobody could blame him for taking that job because it is a bigger job. And if you want to win championships, if you want to coach at the highest level, you got to take the Big Ten job. If you're Pat Chun, you've done everything that you could possibly do at Washington State. Who knows what the money situation is going to look like? 
Who knows what the future is going to look like? You know what the future is in Washington. You don't know what it is at Washington State. If you're Jake Dickert, I understand getting mad at Pat Chun for a little bit, getting a little emotional. But if he were afforded the same opportunity, if Washington, when when Kalen DeBoer left, if they had said, you know, Jake, we really like what you're doing over there in Pullman. We know the situation is a little dicey, uh, but we would love for you to come over and lead the Huskies into the Big Ten. What do you say? I kind of think Jake Dickert would have been a fool not to take it. Like, I really do. I, and I'm sure that if the situation were different, I'm sure that he would have probably taken it. Now, maybe that's different because it's a rival. Like, maybe that's what this is because, I mean, it doesn't get any more heated than Washington State and Washington. I mean, the Apple Cup, you guys know it. But I, I don't blame Pat Chun, who is not a Washington State lifer. You know, he, he got hired there, but he was at FAU before that. So, you know, I don't blame Pat Chun. Uh, and I don't really blame Jake Dickert for getting in his feelings a little bit about this. But I do wonder if he is going to regret having said that uh, and, and being quoted on it, right, for a story. That's, that's what I'm curious about. I'll, I'll, I'm going to wait and see what ends up happening with Jake Dickert because if he ever leaves Washington State, uh, that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem. Uh, topic number five on this one. Let's see. Set the cruise control. Topic number five, Florida State. They filed a new response in Leon County Circuit Court on Wednesday of last week. Um, and look, this is this has to do with the ACC lawsuit from Florida State. We all know about the Clemson lawsuit as well. What this does is basically uh, rehashes some of the stuff that was in the Clemson lawsuit. Um, Florida State stated three different times in three different paragraphs across a 10-page document that they are leaving the ACC. They had not officially said that before. and People thought that maybe there was an option for them to stay in the ACC if they get the unequal revenue distribution stuff passed through. But I think that that's maybe too far gone at this point, and Florida State has said, you know, when we leave the ACC, that's that's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Um, the document also accuses the ACC of misrepresentation multiple times. Um, It says that they are uh, misrepresenting to the court. They emphasize the need for transparency um, because the ACC is trying to stop the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Discovery. They're trying to stop the discovery process because they don't want some of this stuff to go public. And, And ESPN has even been on the ACC side of like Yo, these are trade secrets. These are like this is not for public consumption. Uh, ev- not everybody needs to know how the sausage is made. But Florida State is basically going, yes. Everybody needs to know how the sausage is made. Like that's the deal. Whew. We got a control burn going. And I should have had my, I should have had the air conditioner inside instead of outside. Oh. <laughs> Good gracious. So, so anyway, back to this. Um, Florida State, like they are, they are going balls out for this, and I don't necessarily blame them, right? They, they, they are arguing that ESPN, uh, that the ESPN agreement applies only to Florida State home games, so long as Florida State is still in the conference. That's what they're arguing. They're saying when we leave the conference, ESPN and the ACC will no longer have the rights to our home games. So if we are to join another conference, then that other conference will be able to package our home games to sell to whoever. Or if they go independent, they could do a TV deal with somebody else, NBC or whatever, until they join a conference. And they'll have the rights to their home games. Now, the ACC is saying no, but they don't want anybody to see the documents uh, because those things are under lock and key in Charlotte. I'm 
this is this is going to open up potentially realignment across the board because if they say that these grant of rights aren't worth the paper that they're printed on then nothing is holding anybody back from anything and the the amount of money for some of these like one of the big rumors is Texas A&M leaving the SEC to go to the Big Ten I mean that'd be huge for the Big Ten because then they would have a footprint in the state of Texas Texas A&M didn't want to be in a conference with Texas. But the SEC, of course, was like, you know, this makes a lot more sense. Like, and, and it's a brand like Texas. We can get the rivalry going again. If Texas A&M and Texas wanted that rivalry going again, they'd have had the rivalry going. They didn't have to be in the same conference. So these are two universities, two programs that do not like each other and have not made any kind of an effort to work together. So, if you open up this can of worms, there—I mean, there's no telling. Now, how 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 do TV networks even do these deals? Do you have to do them individually with each school? At that point, like this is these lawsuits are a huge, huge deal. Uh, Florida State is also arguing that uh, it needs to be tried in the state of Florida, not in North Carolina. So they need to kind of get these uh, lawsuits. Are these cases, like, put together? That's their plan anyway. Get that other one out of uh, North Carolina, move it into Florida. You know, help help each other out. That's what they're trying to do. So, yes. Um, moving along. Topic number six. Michigan is making more staff hires, Right. And it's like every week, every few days, you're seeing somebody getting hired into some kind of position at Michigan, right? You had Troy Offord from uh, – uh, or Tony Offord. What did I say? Now my brain's playing church. The running backs coach at um, uh, Ohio State came over to Michigan. So he will now be at Michigan. But the one that I was uh, pointing to is the two G5 hires that they made to – Uh, continue filling out the staff. Uh, Memphis co-defensive coordinator Lou Esposito, who just got hired last year uh, to Ryan Silverfield's staff, he is joining as the defensive line coach for the Wolverines. And SMU's special teams coordinator Garrett Clawson, he is joining as a special teams analyst. I found that interesting. SMU is moving into the ACC. Now, the money situation is going to be a little bit different with SMU than it will be with some of these other programs because SMU's billionaires are going to be playing or paying the salaries and uh, they don't have to accept any payouts from the ACC for like seven years or whatever it is. Pretty long time. But they are saying like Michigan is going through and just grabbing basically whoever they want. Like I, I'm a little shocked at how how easily they're able to make some of these hires. Esposito makes sense. He was at Western Michigan. He's gotten Michigan ties. That makes sense. Clawson, uh, I found it odd that you would go from being a special teams coordinator to being a special teams analyst. That one surprised me. But the money inside of these Power 2 conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC, it's going to be massive. Absolutely massive. All right. Uh, number seven. Topic number seven. Ari Wasserman at The Athletic, uh, the Until Saturday podcast, and he's, he's got an article over at The Athletic about uh, his college football coaching Mount Rushmore. Now, we've done this every now and then. You know, who are your top five or whatever it is, top five coaches of all time, whatever. So he's got his top four college football coaches. And I had trouble with this. All right, so his uh, he had Nick Saban, uh, Pete Carroll, Dabo Sweeney, and Woody Hayes from Ohio State. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you mine. I, I in these I've had these three, and I'm going to think of the fourth on the fly as we're doing this. Nick Saban is my number one. All right, and I'm only going with guys that were around when 
like it since I've been alive. That's what we're going to go with. Uh, but number one, I'm going to have Nick Saban. Greatest to ever do it. Probably better than Bear Bryant. Um, although, yeah, there's no way to really be able to tell that. Yes, he won one more national title than Bear Bryant, but, uh, you know, it, if, if Bear Bryant had a scholarship limit, would he have been able to do what Nick Saban did? Who knows? He just went about it a different way back then because that's how he did it. Um, Steve Spurrier I've got on here because he was the original, you know, the OG head ball coach, right? Uh, wore the visor on the sideline, threw his visor down, would pull players, would play multiple quarterbacks. He was the guy, the fun and gun, all that stuff. The way that they played football was revolutionary at the time. And he was uh, kind of a wise ass, and I enjoyed that. You know, making fun of Phil Fulmer, making fun of uh, Florida State, you know, Free Shoes University, like all this kind of stuff. Even when he was at South Carolina, he joked around about Georgia saying, you know, it's always better to have Georgia early on the schedule because you can you can count on them having somebody suspended for something. Like, he just knew. And he was great at this stuff. He's still great at this stuff. Uh, so Steve Spurrier had to be on there for me. Um, and then I put Bobby Bowden on there. Like, Bobby Bowden, uh, 14 straight top five AP finishes. I mean, that's just, that's why was, until Saban came around, like, you had never seen anything even close to that. Um, and Bobby Bowden's one of those that, like, admitted, yeah, we didn't go to the SEC back in the day because we wanted to be in a conference that was a little bit easier to win. We thought the schedule would be easier in the ACC, and he was right. He was right. So those are my three thus far. Nick Saban, Steve Spurrier, and Bobby Bowden. But outside of that, it's tough for me to try and come up with somebody. I don't think I could put Pete Carroll on there, right? And I don't want to go with some coach that, you know, like if if I had my way, I would probably put Gene Stallings. But he was only the coach at Alabama for six years. He won one national title. He did win Alabama's first, you know, kind of modern era national title uh, in 1992. That was their first one since 1979. And then after that, uh, the first one was not until 17 years later in 2009 when Saban got there. Um, or two years after Saban got there, whatever. So that's probably... My answer would be Gene Stallings on there, but I don't think I don't think enough people know that. I, that was just look. I was seven years old when Gene Stallings got hired at the University of Alabama, uh, 1990, right? And he left in 1996. I do want. I mean, there's been so many others. I guess you know who you know who I'll probably put on there. Uh, let's do the fourth one. I'm going to do Bill Snyder because what. What Bill Snyder did at Kansas State, it, that is not a place that you are supposed to be able to win. And yet, he was able to do it for a long, long time. He built an incredible foundation there. People forget early mm, early 2010s. I mean, he had he had teams that were on the cusp of the national championship. Like, that were just right there. And that kind of stuff is not supposed to happen at Kansas State. So I, yeah, probably do Bill Snyder, even though he he never won a national championship, anything like that. Uh, didn't want to put Bob Stoops on here. Didn't want to put Mac Brown. You know, uh, Jim Trussell. Like it, these are some of the bigger name coaches and whatnot. Um, Larry Blakeney at Troy did big things, but. You know, uh, Jeff Tedford was cool at Cal. Uh, who was the old Southern Miss football coach? Uh, I cannot remember. Was it Jeff Jeff Bowen, maybe? God, I cannot remember. Either way, and n- none of those guys should be on the college football Mount Rushmore. Uh, but, yeah, what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, we're going to do Nick Saban. Uh, Steve Spurrier, Bobby Bowden, and uh, 
an old Kansas State boy. That's what we're gonna do. <laughs> that was a that's a fun exercise. All right, uh, let's see. Topic number eight here: Arkansas left tackle Andrew Chambly. He is entering the transfer portal. Okay, and the reason that this is any kind of news: he he was an SEC uh, all freshman offensive lineman last year, but this guy, uh, Arkansas, said just not even a month ago. They said that uh, he was he was quitting football. He was going to retire, that he didn't have that love for the game anymore. Well, now he's saying that he is planning on entering the transfer portal, and I do wonder if part of that had to do with he just didn't want to go through all the workouts. I guess until he got to his new place. But you can't enter the transfer portal until April. Well, this was reported on March 5th that he was quitting football. So now I'm curious when, and, and somebody will grab him, right? But typically if, so, if you hear news that somebody doesn't have a love for the game anymore, it's going to make you second guess whether or not you want them on your football team. But in this situation, this dude plays left tackle. He was an all-SEC freshman. This dude's going to get a home. Because they do not make left tackles, right? Like, God God didn't put many of those guys on this planet. Uh, so there are football teams that need a guy like that. So he will be able to find another home. But I did find it interesting, very, very interesting, that uh, he quit, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's not, he's not gone. He's not done. So uh, moving along, last topic of the day, topic number nine here. On good old X, Elon's platform, OS underscore Beaver, he tweeted about the rebirth of the modern Pac-10. And he said that he is hearing that the the Pac-2, Washington State and Oregon State, are working diligently behind the scenes to try and build a new conference, a new modern Pac-10. And these are the teams that would be involved. Of course, Oregon State and Washington State But then, along with that, you would have Boise State, UTSA, USF, that's South Florida, Fresno State, San Diego State, UNLV, Memphis, and Tulane. That is 10 teams that make a whole lot of sense, right? Uh, You got the best of the G5 in that spot. Um, You've got the ones that you know, have have built the infrastructure to be in a power conference. Those are all schools that have really invested in their athletics programs that really want to be in a bigger conference. That makes all the sense in the world. The thing that I find interesting is, one, how is it going to work? How, how can you get these other schools out of their contracts? How are you going to pay, like... Are you going to get a TV offer first? Would ESPN be willing to pay some of it? Because all of these schools are in conferences where they make less money than what they would hypothetically make in a new Pac-10, right? So how, how do you begin to negotiate before TV contracts are done? How do you build a con- – like, that's, that's the question. How do you build a conference? I mean, we've been talking about this with the ACC. That's the other question that I've got is whether or not the ACC is going to blow this up by backfilling if Florida State and Clemson were to leave. Like, does does the ACC find a way to get Notre Dame to agree to be in their conference to make it 16 teams? Or do they just backfill and bring in Memphis and Tulane or UConn and whoever else to fill up to 17 or then, like, 18? Do they bring in UConn, USF, Memphis, Tulane? Like, what, 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 what does the ACC end up doing? But I'm curious how you build a conference nowadays. Because everybody has to have assurances. Because they're already in conferences where they know they're making money. If you leave a conference without having a home, then that creates all kinds of other problems, right? You can ask San Diego State about that. Because San Diego State 
tried to let the Mountain West know, hey, we're planning on leaving you. Maybe we just wanted to let you know because we're probably going to the Pac-12. Well, then the Pac-12 blew up. And San Diego State said, whoa, 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 that was not an official notice. We should, like, we're we're still in the Mountain West, right? It, it becomes a whole problem. So if you are going to rebuild a conference or just build a brand new conference, like, think about this. The Mountain West was kind enough to do Oregon State and Washington State a favor and basically set up a scheduling agreement with them for next year. Like, they redid their entire schedules so that Washington State and Oregon State could be a part of this. Now, part of that does help the Mountain West, but they didn't have to do that. How would the Mountain West feel if all of a sudden you come in and take Boise, Fresno, San Diego State, UNLV? The four most likely most valuable brands that they've got. I mean, what, like, it's not a kind way to repay them for their hospitality, I wouldn't think. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. All right. I uh, think that's going to wrap it up for today. I, let me tell you this about that conference. Uh, I would watch that conference. That would be an incredible conference. Uh, some of the travel, right, between, like, Washington State and South Florida, uh, that would be pretty heinous. But it wouldn't be any worse than being a member of the ACC. Right? Because every game in the ACC is going to be just like that. So, just nuts. All right. Let's get out of here. You guys have been fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, I love all of you. I appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you are subscribed, of course, here on the YouTube and on the BetUS College Football Show. Uh, There's a link in the description for that as well. Uh, With that said, let's do this thing. Uh, Happy Easter. Happy April Fool's. All that kind of stuff. Uh, Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football, and hopefully all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.